Yep, all right. Well, good morning, all. Um, my name is Mike Thompson. I'm a vice president at the uh, Pew Charitable Trust, and I head up our state and local government work there. Uh, the Pew Charitable Trust is devoted fact to facts, and we're determined to be nonpartisan. And through our work with state and local governments uh, to be more effective, we've, we've been drawn to the terrific work that's being done here in, in Colorado. And we're extremely grateful to two very special guests that we have today, uh, the governor of Colorado, John Hickenlooper, um, and the co-founder of the New Belgium Brewing Company, uh, Kim Jordan. Thank you both very much for being here. Um, today, what we're gonna talk about is how states and uh, the business community can work together to cultivate uh, economic growth. And if, if you don't mind to our panelists, I'm just gonna take a quick detour here. Uh, we're coming off the heels of Thanksgiving. Uh, and for many of you um, in Thanksgiving, I think we all know uh, today, I'm from the Northeast, uh, better, uh, it's best not to talk about politics at Thanksgiving. I think we can all agree among family. Uh, and that certainly was the case with, uh, with my family uh, over Thanksgiving. Um, that said, uh, if there's one thing that they all agree on, it's a contempt for politicians generally. Um, and so when the subject turned to uh, how's work going uh, for me, um, you know, I talked about, I, I was very selective in how I framed what I was going to be doing this week. And I said to my cousins that I was going to be talking to uh, two very accomplished brewers um, uh, this week. <laughs> um, and uh, they were really interested in that. They thought that was really cool. And I told them more about what I was going to do. And they, they sort of stopped me and said, now, wait a second, Mike, you're going to talk to two of the most successful brewers in the United States and you're gonna do it at nine in the morning in a museum? Um, like, leave it to you to screw things up one way or another, uh, you know? So at any rate, uh, uh, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, and again, if, if uh, we have a national audience uh, watching this by webcast, um, I know many folks here in the room um, know our two guests quite well. Uh, and one thing that's really uh, clear to me coming into contact with them is just uh, how much they come across as, as everyday people, um, uh, you know, everyday business people devoted to the, uh, the common good. Uh, and yet, uh, I'm sort of reminded here of the cowbell skit uh, and Christopher Walken, um, who played uh, Bruce Dickinson. He said, you know, um, I'm just like every guy, I put my pants on one leg at a time, but after I do, I go make gold records, right? And uh, I think about that line and I think about uh, Governor Hickenlooper, you know, and I, I say to myself, well, he puts his uh, pants on one leg at a time, but then after that, he's a very successful businessman. He's an author. He's a two-term mayor. He's a two-term governor of, uh, of, uh, of, of Colorado, uh, the city that everybody wants to live in here in Denver, a booming economy in Colorado. Uh, thrilled to have you here uh, today, Governor Hickenlooper. Uh, and then to, uh, to Kim Jordan, um, who could be an everyday businesswoman, but is actually so much more uh, a co-founder, executive chair, and, and uh, former CEO of New Belgium Brewing. Uh, it's one of the most ex respected and innovative craft breweries in America. And you talk to her uh, employees and her management team, and she doesn't just talk the talk, but she walks the walk of being a 21st century uh, business executive. You've got a very successful company uh, that's committed to healthy communities, employee ownership, open book management, and philanthropic uh, giving. Before I go any further, please join me in welcoming our terrific two panelists here today. <clears throat> Uh, now, at Pew, uh, we believe uh, improving how states regulate is a powerful, sustainable, and cost-effective economic development strategy. We've recently issued a report highlighting common-sense improvements that can make it faster and cheaper for entrepreneurs to launch an innovative new product. These improvements can be business-friendly, and they can protect the environment, increase safety, and improve public health. These ideas and lots of other things that we've highlighted in our report are inspired by exciting accomplishments here in Colorado. Um, and we've convened this conversation today to hear from uh, the governor, um, who's led many of these recent changes, and to hear from the perspective of a top uh, business leader and entrepreneur. Uh, I want to just take time out here to thank, in particular, Lauren Larson, um, who is the director of the planning and budgeting, uh, the Office of Planning and Budgeting here in Colorado. I know the governor would say she's uh, an engine behind a lot of this stuff. We're extremely grateful to all the help she's given us behind the scenes. Thank you very much, uh, director. Um, so uh, we're going to be having a conversation uh, with our panelists, um, and uh, again, we, with a national audience wired in as well. Um, and we're going to have an opportunity to invite you to ask questions a little bit later. Um, but let's start right now with, uh, with our first question. Um, and I want to just take you back to both of your days in, in getting the business off the ground initially. Uh, and, and Governor, I'd love to sort of start with you. Um, you know, we've uh, read so much about your background as an entrepreneur. Can you just sort of walk us through those initial 
initial days uh, and trying to get the business off the ground and you know what you've referred to as the fundamental nonsense of government. Sure, and that's part of how I got into public life was this fundamental nonsense of government. And part of what we've tried to do with people like Laura and Martin uh, is to, to get the nonsense out of it and make it the fundamental values of government. Uh, I also want to give Donna Lynn a shout out. She's our Lieutenant Governor, but also the Chief Operating Officer for the state. So she's kind of the guiding hand there. Uh, we have a whole bunch of team heck here, but also Tony Neal Graves is here, who's our, our broadband czar and has been tasked with cre creating a plan to get broadband into every town in Colorado uh, sometime soon. The end of 2020, maybe, maybe a little bit in 2021. 20, uh, anyway, when I was first opening Wine Coop, I'll tell you a couple stories. One, we had lots of time, because I'd been unemployed for almost two years, uh, but we didn't have much cash. So we were trying to do everything ourselves, and so to get a liquor license, we went to the city of Denver, and a brew pub back then, there was no other brew pub. So you had to get in a commercial uh, zoning district, and yet you were had to get a retail license, which they didn't really have a way to do, and the, the eight pages of forms just to get a normal liquor license were pretty convoluted. Uh, and the head of excise and licenses at that time under Mayor Fed Federico Pena was a guy named Manuel Martinez. And so I went in to see him and he gave me all the forms. I kind of looked at him and I, I, I explained what I was doing and he said, well, he'd do a little research. I did my best to fill him out, came back. And he basically sat down and spent almost two hours. This is the head of excise and licenses walking me through how to get it done. We had to get one little bit of the law changed. Uh, I mean, in the end, we, I did that all, all that licensing with no, no assistance. Uh, the other story I always love to tell, I grew up originally outside of Philadelphia. I've been in Colorado for 40 some years, but uh, when we were, the night before we were supposed to have this big party to kind of dry run of opening our restaurant. That Friday, we had the building inspector come by and we knew that we were only going to get a, a temporary certificate of oc occupancy, right, a, a TCO, but we had to get it by that Friday afternoon, and it was now four o'clock, so all the carpenters had left, the plumbers had left, and, uh, and we had this big party on Sunday night, the, the, the dry run. And the, the final building inspector, the czar, you know, kind of a little, pretty, pretty high opinion of himself, uh, walks, we're down the basement and going up the, the service stairs, so the public would never go up these stairs, it's where the grain would go in and out of the basement, and he stops, he goes, I'm not sure this railing is the right height. And sure enough, the railing was an inch too low. And I went, you've got to be kidding. And he goes, well, the rules are rules. We've got to, you know. And I, you know, I was, so we'd gone through this like for, for 10 days. No one had ever said a word about the railing. So I said, I looked at him and I said, maybe I have to make some sort of a contribution to the retired building inspector's fund or something <laughs> like that. And he was walking away, going up the steps. And he stopped. He goes, Mr. Hickenlooper, I don't know where you grew up, but it obviously wasn't in Colorado. One more crack like that and it'll be months before you open. I'm on my way to my car to get my screw gun, and you and I together will lower this thing an inch, and we'll make sure you get, o you get open. And those are kind of two examples of, of certainly in the West, where the, the sense of bureaucracy in offices uh, and, and you know, bu bureaucracy and government uh, weren't so much filled with nonsense. Although, then the last quite, when I, what got me, what part of what got me to run for mayor uh, in the, in the, great, the recession of 2001 uh, and the dot-com bubble had burst and revenues were down for the city. And so the city was going to raise parking meters. They were going to double the cost of parking meters. And every small business person knows when, when your sales are going down anyway, the last thing you want to do is, is create the cost. You don't raise your prices. You try to find ways to lower your prices. Uh, anyway, so we got eight of our businesses. We went in and met with the mayor. Uh, his, his senior staff, they listened, they nodded their heads. We understand that supply and demand, of course. Two days later, they doubled the price of parking meters. And that, you know, then I ran six months later, a year later, ran for mayor and did a TV ad. I think it's still up on YouTube uh, called Change. But the voiceover was sort of right out of high noon, right? One of those old Gary Cooper Westerns. Well, you guys are too young to know who Gary <laughs> Cooper is. But anyway, the, 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 we, I played the part of a guy who was kind of the hero coming in with the sun behind me, and this other guy was writing parking tickets, you know, and, and I had a change belt. So just as he was about to write the parking ticket, I put a quarter in the parking meter. And I kind of the voiceover explained that this was the fundamental nonsense of government, which is what we ran our whole campaign on, uh, is to try and bring basic common sense back.
So, Governor, we're going to fast forward to, to modern day um, in terms of uh, you know how you were navigating this then as, as the elected official running all these regulatory systems. But first, Kim, uh, your experience then, uh, initial days trying to get the business off the ground, what was your experience uh, with the regulators? So you weren't implying that the, that when he opened, it wasn't modern day. <laughs> we opened at about the same time. So... Um, <laughs> We started in the basement of our house, and um, one of the, th let me give a little background here. In our business, you have federal regulation through the um, TTB, the uh, Tax and Trade Bureau, the ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms is underneath that, how we got associated with tobacco and firearms <laughs> beyond me, but anyway. Um, so you have the federal government, then you have the state government, then you have the city and county governments, and each plays a, a very different role in the whole process. At the federal government level, we applied for what's called our uh, brewer's permit, and um, we were told that they would not, and we, not unlike uh, Governor Hickenlooper, we were we did all of our own applications for everything because we didn't have money to spend paying lawyers to do that. And the ATF came back and said that they were not going to grant us the license because we were attached to our house. Fortunately, we knew of precedent for that, so we were able to you know send back to them both pictures and statements from other people who had licenses and they um, they overruled their own um, uh, objection and we were able to get our federal license, which is just one of those lessons entrepreneurs talk about where sometimes you have to keep going even when you think that it's not going to be possible. Um, so, but it's a similar kind of experience that you're trying to open and, and cash is never in big supply mm -hmm. at the start of a project. And so every day for us, you know, what it was kind of a second mortgage on our home. So it wasn't quite like the experience of paying rent to a landlord, but every day that you're not opening and bringing in revenue, is a day that, you know, whatever small amount of capital you've amassed to get this thing off the ground is not going. So um, modern day, similar kind of story. We have um, a couple of brew pubs in San Francisco, and we just finished remodeling one of them. We opened it uh, about a month ago, and it was right on the same day that the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco, cl they closed the transit center. So the city was total gridlock. This woman who was the health inspector, and in their system, she's the last person, um, needed, to, needed to do the inspection so we could open that night. And it was four o'clock, it was five o'clock, and it's Friday. We're thinking it's Friday, five o'clock. If she doesn't make it, we can't, we can not only not open today, but we can't open all weekend because until she's inspected, we can't open. So we um, offered to pay her for an Uber for her, and she said, I can't take that. And she finally said, How about someone comes to get me? So we, one of us went over, drove there, got her, and at about six o'clock on a Friday, she did the full inspection. She didn't have to do that, but she did. And it's those little moments of grace where, you know, people who are maybe underappreciated and, and even in some situations undercompensated compared to, you know, the private market who decide on a Friday to go ahead because they know, and, and for me, I've been thinking about what are the lessons um, of, of business and government working, and certainly one of them is um, each side understanding the other's perspective. And I wanna pick up on that point and return to you, Governor. Uh, so it, you get to the point where now you've uh, assumed responsibility for overseeing this entire regulatory system at, at the state level. Um, how, how did you uh, reassure the people that you were overseeing that you were invested in these systems, yet at the same time, uh, all those business experiences that you had, you know, make sure that those were applied 
uh, to the system that you were overseeing? Um, I think part of it is just, you know, it starts at the top. So we, we set up a system. We started this program from 2011 when I first took office uh, called uh, Cut the Burden. And the goal of Cut the Burden was to go and try and make it easier for businesses to open. That was the first priority. But then equally and probably more importantly, make sure that the burden of regulation was lessened as much as we possibly could, recognizing you need some level of regulation in the world. And so I would go to each of the different, there, there were six different agencies that we originally started with going through all these rules and regulations. And ultimately, we got, we got to all of our agencies, uh, 24,000 rules and regulations, of which almost 11,000 we either eliminated or dramatically simplified. But that original part, we'd go to each agency, and I would go and explain the philosophy of why I thought this was important. Uh, during my campaign, we developed the three E's, efficiency, uh, efficient, effective, and elegant. Of course, elegant, I just wanted to have another E. And, and I wanted to talk about customer service. So we said, well, elegant's kind of like customer service. Um, but that was what the message I would give to each, you know, all the managers in these agencies, but then as many of the, the you know, the middle level managers and even some of the rank and file of why this was important and how big a difference it could make. Uh, and I think that kind of grew into a kind of a movement within the, within the state. And uh, we hired a guy about, oh gosh, almost four years ago named David Padrino, who came out of, a, uh, I think it was the Boston Consulting Group. He'll kill me for not knowing that. It, it was the Boston Consulting Group. <laughs> Donald's nodding affirmatively. <laughs> uh, you know, close one. Anyway, he came in and, and helped lay the foundation for a dashboard where we would, part of this cutting rules and regulation also was to get people to believe in government. And you can't do that without making it transparent. And so we would set out what our ambitions were, what our goals were, and sort of do everything in a, in a transparent way to create that sense of trust. And once you begin to get trust between the regulated and the regulators, you can get compromises. And we, we kind of, compromises are where you really begin to make progress. And we, we joke about how we, we, we collaborate at the speed of trust. Because trust is the, the critical, uh, most important uh, fuel for this kind of work. And sort of similar, I mean, Kim is not only to make some of the greatest beer in the world, and as a brewer, I can say that, but was the first person who actually went whole hog, or, or, or I think the first brewery, one of the very first breweries, to, to let her employees. Because in a funny way, your, regula your regulations and rules affect, you don't have to deal with the government, but also your employees are the ones. And, and, and for businesses, I mean, I'm not, I'll let you ask the questions, but that's something that she did long before anybody else did. And I, I want to come back to Kim on, on that point, but uh, you, know, you talk about this, this trust uh, that, that's so important, and, and Kim talks about the importance of time um, and, and how each lost minute is, is, you know, can spell success or doom for these businesses. So what, what are you telling the, the, the staff in these different agencies um, to uh, help them appreciate the cost of time? while at the same time um, making sure that they trust that you're still invested in, in the enforcement of these regulations. What I told them, and again, I think it's one of the important things to success in business or government is the alignment of self-interest. In other words, let everyone see how in the end this is gonna help them. And it, when I first came in, you know, the, we had the Great Recession in 2008, 2009, 2010. And so I would go to our state employees and say, you know, right now there is no appetite in the public to give you a raise. If I went out and put in our budget, we were gonna give you guys a 3% raise, which you deserve. They went two years without a raise before I got there. Uh, they're gonna kill me. The, the public would kill me, not the employees. I said, the way to do this is to be able to demonstrate to the, to the world that you're saving businesses and, and, and our community uh, uh, money. So to cut the burden as we, part of that was to make, make sure we measured every way that we were uh, saving time, cutting money. Basically now, on an annualized basis, we're, we're, we're saving uh, 2.3 million hours a year. And, this, and that's time spent by employees of businesses. And then another, I think it was $8 million of hard costs of just all the mailing stuff, packaging things, doing all this stuff to, to keep up with unnecessary regulations. And that was the key was to say, all right, we know we need some regulations, but how do we get it to, to the, the minimum amount to, to protect the public interest, but make it as, you know, make our businesses as successful as possible so we can give our employees a raise, more money? And uh, that worked pretty well. I mean, that got, 
part of what also worked was we allowed each agency to measure their success each year. And as, as things went along, they got through more regulations, they began to see that they were making a meaningful difference in, this, in the state. So Kim, one of the things that's been so interesting for us at Pew is, is hearing in Colorado just how this focus has been on how the state regulates, um, not just sort of whether it should regulate or what the rules are, but how these rules are administered. Um, so I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, uh, you know, how do you get a, a business community, business leaders generally, to be invested in that discussion as opposed to just, you know, should we do away with these rules or not? I mean, how do you start to get a, a lot of business leaders excited about sort of the discussion and invested in a discussion about how to regulate? Well, let me start by saying <clears throat> I personally am not anti-regulation, and I think, unfortunately, the roadway is littered with um, examples of people who will um, do something that's in their personal best interest that may not be interest in the best interest of the collective. And um, that's unfortunate, but it is um, a part of the reality. And I think one kind of understanding what are perceived threats and or harms and what are actual harms is um, a, a place where business can help um, in that trusting conversation to help paint the picture of where things might actually be problematic um, in terms of if we don't regulate this or that, um, and where you're kind of um, an example for me that's current in the state in terms of alcohol law is um, that breweries are not allowed to make cider. I don't know why. They don't know why, really. But that's what the rule is. And so, you know, I can see saying, no, you can't make spirits, but spirits is a whole different process with a whole different set of equipment. But cider is something that can be made in the same vessels, but for reasons that aren't really clear, can't be done. So how do you go about, um, one, I think, I think you, um, encourage a, uh, a trusting relationship. I think you um, uh, pinpoint progressive or, or, or positive leadership in the business community who can talk about the benefits, you know, wh where the sweet spot of regulation is between too much and not enough. Um, you know, there are interesting examples in our industry where um, enforcement, no enforcement does none of us any good because if you're busy trying to be sure that you're following the law and maybe other, you know, it just it creates a chaotic marketplace if there's not some sense that, you know, we're all supposed to be paying attention to the law. So I think, I think you tap leaders um, who can kind of spread the gospel and bring the right people to the table. And I think it ta you do it at the speed of trust. It takes a long time and a lot of transparency and a willingness to come. I think elegant is exactly the right word because I think that um, in addition to starting with E, it, um, it is that place where when you get there, everyone knows yep. like, yep, we are right and we are right where we're supposed to be. Enough regulation, enough discussion and transparency about where we're going and enough time to have all of that happen. No one wants the regulation to, that's not an E, we'll have to figure out where that fits. <laughs> but. No one wants to get the regulation that starts in January now. Yep. Uh, Governor, when you talk to your friends in uh, conservation, uh, transportation safety, you know, who, who get anxious when they uh, hear about um, making these regulations more business friendly. Uh, one of the, the, the neat things that has come out of Colorado is, is how a lot of these improvements have actually uh, had these uh, uh, positive impacts. Um, and I wonder if you could just give a couple of examples and sort of talk about how this has actually been a win-win uh, in many ways. Well, I'll give you one very good example. And, and again, we, our goal, and this is when I was running in 2010 as per governor of the first term, our goal was to make Colorado the most pro-small business, pro-business state, but with the highest uh, ethics, the highest 
you know, the, the highest environmental standards, the highest ethical standards. We want to make that an essential, another E, an essential part of, of this system. And so I got, you know, fairly shortly after I got elected, uh, I was talking to an environmental, a big, big national CEO of one of the large environmental firms. And he looked at me and he goes, well, you know, you've got to come down. You're the, one of the top five states with oil and gas. You've got to come down on these fugitive emissions. You know, methane escaping is, is 60 times worse than CO2. I said, yeah, I'm aware of that, and I've, but I just got elected, you know, give me a little bit of time. But sure enough, five months later, I'm, four months later, I'm sitting there talking to the CEO of one of the large oil and gas operators, right, to drill wells, to find oil, produce it. Uh, and I just kind of, just to see how he'd react. It's like putting your finger in the hot water and you're not sure how hot it is. Uh, I said, well, you know, one of these days you guys are going to have to sit down at the table around methane regulations and fugitive emissions, escaping gases. He looked at me and he goes, well, yeah, I, we'd do that. But as soon as we do that, your environmental people are going to come out and they're going to, we'll end up spending a lot of money that doesn't do any good. We'll, we'll create a whole mountain of red tape and bureaucracy. Uh, uh, and in the end, the environmental nonprofits will get all the credit. I said, really, that's the problem? Because I can kind of address that. So we spent another 45 minutes working through each of those and what it might look like. And then I went back to the environmental community and said, hey, are, are you OK if, if we could do methane regulations to make them as lean in terms of red tape and paperwork as possible? Can we make sure that every dollar they spend actually makes the air cleaner? And, and then third, at the end of this, this is where we had a little process with some of the environmentalists. I said, can we share the credit? And uh, in the end, after some discussion, the, the, I had to point out to the environmental community, listen, if the oil and gas guys don't agree to this, there isn't going to be a celebration. <laughs> uh, so in the end, everyone agreed to this. And it was a little bit like the Hatfields <laughs> and the McCoys. I mean, there was no trust. Everyone hated each other. Uh, and the government role was really to be the convener and bring people together and create a safe space where everyone felt that they were getting a fair shake. And that, that meant we did not create a timeline in advance. We did not lay out a framework of what we wanted to get done. We had scientists from the oil and gas industry, scientists from the environmental community come in together. And, and we created a, a sphere of, of, of what we're going to try to accomplish uh, and a timeline for it. And then a kind of rough draft of, of what things we might look at as success. And then they all went back and came back you know, two weeks later and, and had flesh on the bones, and they, you know, they began to really begin working towards the future. Now, twice, we had once one side, once the other side. People walked out. They said, that's not just, that, that's crazy. It's over the top. And they, they, they threw up their hands. And our job, my job, uh, in, well, both, in both cases, was to make sure that the feathers got unruffled and everybody came back. And, you know, it took about 14 months altogether. It took four months just going through all the scientific papers and getting both sides to compromise on what they were really saying, how much, how much fugitive emissions were coming out of uh, producing plants, storage vessels, pipelines, whatever, and then how, what's the best way to go after eliminating those leaks. But, but in the end, uh, it, it is the, the oil and gas industry agreed through this regulatory framework, they spend about $60 million a year. as the equivalent of, re of removing 340,000 cars from our roads. And mm -hmm. that, to me, is kind of, the right way to go about regulation where both sides, and, and neither side was perfectly happy, right? The environmentalists wanted to get more. A lot of the smaller oil and gas companies thought this was outrageous and how could they still operate? Uh, but I mean, there it is. Every year we have our air is uh, significantly cleaner. Great story. Um, Kim, you, know, you and I talked earlier about uh, uh, the challenges a, a business owner can face in trying to navigate the local, the state, the federal. Uh, different bureaucracies. Uh, Governor, I want to turn to you on this point and then come back to Kim. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you know, you've, you've obviously administered these, these systems at the local and at the state level. Uh, when you have regulators convened from the federal level, from the state level, from the local level, what's the, what's the, the key messages you, know, you think they need to be hearing about sort of the interplay of these different systems? And then, Kim, I'd love to, for you to give us sort of the, the business person's perspective on, on the consistency that, and the inconsistency that sometimes you have to navigate. And that's a hard question because it, in each different area that you regulate, you're going to have, have different levels of disruption between the local, the state, and the federal. We focused, when I, my first executive order, so I got elected 
governor, uh, and, and my inaugural day was January 11th of 2011. One slash one one slash one one. I didn't pick that. It's just what what God decided. Anyway, I you know actually I started out that day as mayor, and I thanked all my staff. Uh, we had a reception at like 8:30, and thanked everyone and talked a lot about kind of the, how we change regulations there, and and re I was reminded there, and we'd already been talking about this of the conflict that often happens between state. And, and local communities in terms of regulation. So anyway, then I walked across Civic Center, uh, swore, the, swore my oath of office, gave my inaugural address, and then the first thing I saw, signed, my first executive order, which was on a table beside the dais, was a commitment that the state would, would give no unfunded mandates to the local communities, to the counties or municipalities, that any rules and regulations that we that we created, we would make sure that they were part of. And, and we've had great partners. I don't know if Tracy Kraft Tharp is still here, or Tracy was here. So we have, we're lucky to have se several people, both in our House of Representatives and our, and our State Senate, that really cared about this stuff and wanting to get it right. Uh, and actually, Tracy wasn't there yet, but she has been a, a bulwark ever since. Um, and you know that, that executive order had a huge amount to do with, um, with how to uh, make more efficient uh, the relationship between the state and the local communities. So then I'm governor, and now I see up close and personal the, the disconnection between the federal government and their rules and regulations and the states. And, and we could not get this done. In other words, the districts by which the, uh, the Department of Transportation in Washington or the Department of, uh, of Health and Human Services or, you know, uh, you go down the list, uh, they all have their regions set up. Their regions don't correspond in any way to the regions that the state has. How could that be, right? I mean, and, and talk about trying to set, change them and say, all right, well, what do we, let's do this by watersheds and drainages. Let's figure out a common way we can all agree to, to, to get the right number of people in the right area in these districts, but we can have the same districts. And in eight years, I could not get it done with resistance on both sides. But anyway, those are, that's some of the basic stuff. Uh, you look at uh, uh, issues uh, like some of the Environmental Endangered Species Act issues. So you're kind of t bouncing back and forth between the Department of the Interior and, and the Department of Agriculture, and then going to the counties uh, and trying to figure out, you know, the, the, the sage grouse. Endangered, or not, it, it's a threatened, it's not endangered, uh, and yet we've done all this work getting local nonprofits to work with counties to all voluntarily create improvements in ha habitat for the sage grouse, or as we called her, the bird. <laughs> a lot of the farmers weren't very happy about this. Uh, but in the end, you know, by getting everyone to realize that this habitat was long-term going to help them have the flexibility for farmers and ranchers to have different land uses on their property by having enough habitat so that all of our species were, were growing and not, and not dwindling, that that was a long-term goal. And what we did, which made a tremendous amount of sense, is we got the Western Governors Association. So Governor Meade in Wyoming, Governor Bullock in, in, in Montana, uh, Governor Otter in Idaho, we all banded together and said, we're going to make our own uh, improvements and, and, and how we're going to approach the, the sage grouse in concert with the federal government. But at the end, we're going to stick with our plan and really push back. And, and the federal government somewhat grudgingly agreed to give us the freedom to do that. And that's, I think, where you get the best regulations is you start from the bottom and go up mm -hmm. and let the federal government then kind of bless it. Terrific, thank you. Uh, Kim, real quick, I know we have to open up for questions. Just on the, on the whole issue of consistency uh, from a business owner's perspective, a few thoughts on that. Yeah, I would say predictability is the other piece of that. And um, so the 19th Amendment, which was to repeal prohibition, the only reason that was allowed to go through was that states were given the right, states' rights, to um, regulate alcohol as they saw fit. And in many states, that's even county by county or municipality by municipality. And so it's a very, you know, you end up with a label that um, it, they've since changed it, but in Texas, anything over 6% had to be called ale, no matter if you know anything about beer, um, ale and beer have, they're really, fermentation types and yeast types. It has nothing to do with alcohol strength. So somebody somewhere decided ale meant strong, 
and beer meant not strong, even though, you know, so you're naming things that are actually um, beers or, or lagers, you're naming them ales because there's a law that says you have to. And so you, so then what do you do? Do you, in the rest of your states, do you call it a lager, even though somewhere else you call it an ale, and that means you have to use two different labels, and that means you have to have two TTB um, approvals for those labels, not to mention you have to segregate the Texas beer because you can't, you know, send anything to Texas that has, a, you know, that doesn't have ale on. So, and and that's one minor example. Um, and finally, we got somebody to go to them and say, "Come on, you know, like this has no bearing in reality." But but there are those kinds of laws um, all over the United States, and they're every there. That's one minor example. There are thousands and thousands of them that have to do with trade practices. And, and, and we're not likely to change that because it was a part of the Constitution. So, and, and for us it's important, but for the vast number of Americans, it's not important. Well, I think it's an, also an important reminder, and this is what we keep coming back to at Pew, that uh, we focus so much, you know, especially coming from inside the Beltway, on the, what the federal government does and does not regulate and how, and really how at the end of the day, this is all actually playing out at the state and local level. And Governor, appreciate your point about from the bottom up, looking at this rather from the top down. Uh, it's time to open it up for questions um, and uh, engage our terrific panelists here. Um, any questions from the audience? And while you think of one, I'm going to ask another wait, one. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, Let me throw in one other thing, just because yes, it's such sir. a good example, uh, that we are uh, changing the way we're selling beer to supermarkets. So I got a call a few weeks ago from Kim, who was on, I was slaving away in my office. Kim was on, where were you? Some tropical place. I can't remember where it was. It was pretty nice. I think I was in Todos Santos. Oh, yeah. That's right. Now I remember. Uh, on, um, CSU has a campus there. Oh, yeah. Working hard, working hard. I know. They're always a hard, rigorous life that entrepreneurs live. Yeah, right. uh, but anyway, we had somehow, uh, in the legislative process, we, hadn't, we were allowing supermarkets. In the old days, they had to sell uh, what was called 3-2 beer. Uh, it had its own special legal name, and we got we changed that so they were going to be able to sell regular beer, but we left the names in place. And because that happened, but now the, the, basically supermarkets were going to be able to sell both. Malt liquor and full strength beer is what they were called. Again, an example of Maltus Maltus liquors, I think, is what it was. A anyway. <laughs> anyway, so so what happened was the the breweries. What that, so all the, the, the ridiculous regulation where they had to be stored in separate rooms, they could have to be delivered in separate trucks. Fermented in separate, so, even though it's the fat tire would have been the exact same fat tire, but we would have had to ferment it in two different vessels. It was, it was amazing. And, and in, the, in the paperwork, in the legal stuff, you had, I mean, there were, you could argue it one way or the other, and we found a better way to argue it. But... These things arise, and the regulators, and, and we have, I think, our Department of Revenue, which is where this is uh, lives, uh, I think, is one of the more flexible, and you know, they'll work with people. Uh, but they had looked at the most conservative way of interpreting it, and so I sat down and got a couple of lawyers, you know, the, some of the smartest lawyers I got, and said, "Well, can we look at it this way? Because you know, all language is malleable, and, and you know." just the way contracts can be litigated and changed, so can rules and regulations. So we figured out a way to get it you know, fixed, but it was like pulling hair out. I mean, it was, so, you know, even if they're your rules and regulations, they're not so easy to change sometimes. We, we couldn't actually change the real language until the legislature gets back mm -hmm. in the session in, in January. So, Governor, you've been head of the National Governors Association. Uh, we've got now, I, I believe, more than one out of three states are going to be swearing in new governors uh, in, in not too far from now. Um, I don't know one of those governors that isn't talking about trying to sort of make the regulatory thicket easier to navigate. I mean, that's something everybody wants to do, right? Um, and yet, uh, you know, it's, it's not as though we've seen a lot of the changes that have happened here adopted elsewhere. I'm, I'm curious, what's, what do they need to do that has sort of eluded them in the past? And, and what kind of challenges are they going to uh, run into that, that might sort of make it hard for them to, to be successful? Well, it is a... 
an interesting time, you know, what I called good government, which is sort of what a big part of what drove me to run for mayor in 2003 and then to run for governor in 2010, was never politically popular. If you look on polls and lists of the top 15 things that the public cares about, good regulations never appears on those lists, right? It's just not there, it's not in people's, so you can go Oxymoron. and campaign on it, and no one's really gonna remember what you said or talk about it to their neighbor the next day. It's not politically valuable, and yet I think it's powerfully essential for, for a state to grow their economy, right? The predictability that, that Kim was talking about being so important, that's part of this whole thing. We, you know, part of the way you get to good regulations is also to, we set up, uh, we've now done over 600 uh, lean, or is it, it's more than that now, right? It's like 800 or how many? A thousand, that's how fast we're moving. But a thousand lean processes, right? So like the Toyota lean processes where you take everybody involved in a process, like how do you get a driver's license? And you get everybody in the same room and everybody, you start with a blank slate and everybody puts in, how could we make this better? What are the things that I'm involved in that, that might make this better? And if you change something, you have everyone in the room at the same time who's above you and, lo and behind you in, that, in the timeline of that process to say, oh no, you can't do that because then that, this would cause this chain reaction. So it's a wonderful way to really go through and make your rules and regulations more uh, efficient, but it's certainly not politically attractive. So we had a boot camp for new governors two weeks ago down in Colorado Springs. We had 17 of the new governors. I think they're 19 or something like that. Uh, uh, we had almost all of them. And one of the things we really pitched was this notion of having a, uh, you know, a, an institute we call, what is the name of the institute again? I can't remember. For the Performance Management Academy. Originally, it was called the Institute of Good Governor, Institute of, of, of uh, whatever. Anyway. But that didn't poll well, the right? Institute yeah, so. of whatever. <laughs> the Institute of Whatever. The Institute of Whatever it was. Um, but I think what, what almost all these governors looked at was the basic framework, which is you got to measure everything, right? If, if something doesn't get measured, it doesn't get done. And we really pitched hard this notion of having a chief operating officer, because state governments. You know, when Donald Lynn was our first chief operating officer, came in uh, almost three years ago, and it, it automatically transformed the way our state government ran because historically, you know, you've got a governor and you've got a chief of staff, and the chief of staff kind of runs the government, you know, does most of the operating part of it, and, and, and the politics and deals with the legislature because the governor's out having to speak to the public and, and, and meet with people, resolve issues, and get the environmentalists, everyone together, kind of dealing with the daily business of the of 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 the the larger stuff up front and co uh, up close and personal the the chief operating officer allowed us to go much more uh rapidly into regulatory reform and things like that so of those 17 governors at the boot camp at the broadmoor two weeks ago i think by the time we left 14 of them were going to have chief operating officers of some sort maybe not the way we did it but it allows you'd have a chief of staff who really kind of Covers the, covers the governor's back, you know, does the politics, works with the legislature, meets with the, the business community, and then the chief operating officer really meets with all the agency heads and, and really operates, to a large extent, the, the government. And Bill Haslam, who's the governor, governor of Tennessee, Tennessee yeah. was, he and I raced each other to see, because we both kind of had the idea together, um, but he beat me. He had the first chief operating officer. And I, I think both of us now, having done it for several years, feel that it is a, a market improvement in terms of how much you can get done in government. But the, if I'm hearing you right, uh, two things that sort of your cautions is, uh, yes, this sounds good, yes, you want to do it, but first, it's, it's not going to be politically sexy work. Uh, <laughs> and, and secondly, it's going to be a, a lot of getting in the weeds that you're going to need to have somebody running point for you on. Exactly. Right? And, and you have to, again, what we gave the new governors was a, again, we tried to align their self-interests and say, if you think about it, going out to the business community, and we had a thing called pits and peeves, where we went out to businesses all across the state, industry, you know, different industries, and asked them to come to a meeting in Grand Junction or in Salida or you know, uh, Fort Morgan, come in and tell us what are your peeves, what, 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 are, what, are, what, what are the pits in, in, in your regulatory framework, and what would you like us to change? And going out and asking businesses, how can we help you? How can we save, and this is before we knew we'd got to get, we would be saving 2.3 million hours a year. I mean, that is crazy. That's just a lot, 
a lot of time and a lot of efficiency that we didn't know was being wasted out there. But thinking about aligning self-interest, you go out to these businesses, you say, hey, we want to remove regulatory burden. We want to make your, your business more popular. And we, what we told the new governors was, it might be the easiest way to win over people that maybe didn't vote for you, but you're going out to them and help, t telling them how you, as the governor, is go are going to make them more money just doing what they've been doing before. And pretty much everyone smiled. I think I would add that um, it's important, you know, Donna clearly had that capability and it, there's a, and it strikes me that in doing that, you get someone who then also has their fingers on who's got a program out there that's really great versus like who's just honestly phoning it in and, and so you start to be able to, you know, elevate the ones that are doing exemplary work and also sort of put pressure on the other people to start doing more so that because one of the things in um, I surveyed all my uh, management co-workers about being on this uh, fireside chat we have a fire <laughs> here somewhere um, oh, Tilly. and um, one of the things they said was if you're not hiring good people who really know you know you can put in uh, a new IT system for people to be able to file things online but if it's designed by someone who is not radically great at that kind of work then you end up with people who are just as frustrated as they ever were because it's supposed to be better but it's actually worse so you need someone who can go out there and assess what's you know it's there's a, like a tripling of benefit of that coo position i think right. just we, as you see in business we, we were lucky that donna lynn had had the modest job of she'd been executive vice president of Kaiser Permanente ran everything pretty much pretty much everything outside of California. So she was running eleven billion dollars of enterprise. Uh, she was ready to handle it. It, it. it did make all the difference. I'm going to keep scanning the room for hands, but I'm going to take advantage of just following up on this particular uh, discussion thread, which is uh, 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 super interesting um, to me. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we talk about measuring, and if if you're not keeping score, you're just practicing. You know, the the, the importance of of making sure we're keeping track of what's happening. And, and Kim, you pointed out that sometimes people aren't things aren't performing the way you want them to. Talk to me about the transparency that government sees. Do you get to do you get to see, so to speak, sort of the, the time frames shortening from particular agencies? Do you all talk about it with your uh, peers? Um, you know, does, are there any surprises sometimes when you see the metrics? Uh, and then, Governor, how are you sharing those uh, with, with business leaders, and what kind of feedback are you getting? The metrics that we see from um, different regulatory Correct. agencies. Yep. Yep. As, as, as we're keeping track of more and more, how is, how is business sort of watching that um, and taking an interest in it? And then, you know, Governor, uh, what, what sort of dialogue is that created with business that's been particularly helpful? Well, I think for us, I mean, the prime example is the TTB. Um, and it's not and for the, our viewers here ttb uh, again uh, tax and trade bureau and we submit for every single beer that goes in a package we have to submit a label and if any of you are familiar with craft brewing so in the last five years we've gone from 2,000 craft brewers in the united states to 7,000 in mm -hmm. five years and it, I'm making this up, but if there, if each of those 2,000 breweries had 10 beers, they now have about 50 beers for each brewery. So TTB has some number of people who are doing their um, their oversight of labels. And you immediately think, okay, we have to figure out a new system here because if they've got even twice as many people, we're inundating them and you and you just have to anticipate you know what did take 30 days now takes six months and how are we gonna you know uh, pay attention to that and our build that into our own process and and how do you sort of I mean to both of you uh, business owners and, and getting to be realistic about time frames you know the, the person who says you know I'm, I'm ready to open the, the building now you know why aren't you why aren't the inspectors here tomorrow and sort of I, I, I got to get this going right away I mean how do you how do you increase people's just sense of planning and being predictable on their end you know any suggestions there to business leaders governor well, 
I guess for me at least, having been in the position of trying to start a business and not having enough money, and a couple times almost quitting, just because things burdened, oftentimes it was something that, the, that seemed ridiculous, that the uh, regulatory, you know, the building department or, or one of the other city agencies forced us to do, I don't know, to, to expand the number of urinals you have. Uh, and I understand why you want to have enough urinals in a bathroom, I get it, but if you're one short, so there's a line, people aren't going to come back to your restaurant, right? I mean, there's a kind of a balance there. And, and if you've been at the point of, you know, our first summer, we opened in October, it was just this, it was our 30th anniversary this last October. So we opened October 18th of, of 1988. And there was, you know, a, a period that first summer where we, people were staying home barbecuing, our business was down 10%, and we weren't on top of it, we almost went out of business. My brother had to loan us a bunch of money, I mean, $25,000, which was a whole bunch of money back then. And that, you know, that experience gives me a sense of urgency. So when someone tells me that this is a serious problem and we gotta deal with it, I hear it. Uh, I think the only way government can anticipate that and, and help make sure that a, a business a responsible business owners getting a fair shake is that is who you hire and it's funny you can you know when I'm interviewing people that are going to be part of the regulatory framework I would always and I've only hired a few but uh, I would look at because you don't want someone who you want someone who cares about making people happy right the world is full of pleasers so you want someone who's got some of that DNA that they it matters to them that people are happy so and that usually comes with some sense of urgency uh, but you don't want to be you know a bamboozler in other words somebody that's easily Ah, uh, you know, it goes along with it because a lot of business owners are, are, are in some way trying to get things done and they don't care, you know, they don't care about the public maybe as much as they should. Uh, and those bamboozlers, is, that's a, a pleaser who's just, will fall for any line. So you need someone who's strong and going to hold their ground, but also has, wants to, wants to see, wants to please. Yeah, I would describe that as, um, you know, you need someone who, who, is not emotionally invested in, you know, punishing people, but <laughs> kind of back more in the elegance framework. You know, I want my department to run in a way where people say, wow, their decisions were smart, they were timely, they made sense to me, I know why they want me to do that thing, or their process we talked earlier about a process where maybe uh, in Larimer, or in, actually in Fort Collins, you go in for a conceptual review. So you take your plan in and you say, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that. And there's someone from every department at your meeting and they say, well, here's a problem I see and you'll want to address it. So you're not bringing your plan that's totally baked and you take it in and they're like, well, there are all of these problems with it. We can't approve this. You get an opportunity early on to understand where the hurdles are gonna be. And that's the elegant path as opposed to the gotcha path. Mm -hmm. And you don't want people, you, you, you need people whose investment, that hospitality investment you're talking about to be about, you know, we're gonna uphold the regulation, but it's not, but it's because we, these are the best regulations and we understand which ones have, you know, really deflect harm as opposed to it's, um, well, that's the law is a terrible <laughs> response to an issue. Governor, you mentioned the vital role of your COO, and I'm, I'm thrilled to see her right here front and center. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, you had a question or a comment? I actually have a question for Kim, just given that your business is multiple, oh, thank you. It's for Kim, given that your business is multiple states, and if you've seen one state, you've seen one state, what kind of resources do you have to put into dealing with state regulators and um, are there ways, and you know, I see the book, State Strategies to Help Businesses Launch and Expand, and I think we have a collaborative relationship, but how do you, how are you working with all these other states and what kind of resources do you have to put into that? We have a staff of um, 
a legal staff in-house as well as paralegals because it's it takes a lot of people i mean you first you have the regulatory issues for alcohol but then you have the tax issues for employment or you know sales within the state and um you know, we also have that in Colorado, both at the state and at the county level. How do we, how is personal property tax, um, you know, ha, is our equipment uh, valued on the same schedule at the county level as at the state level, which it's not, by the way, in this case. So, but I, I have a story about that that I think maybe speaks to a slightly, so there's a, there's a significant amount of investment we have to have, and every state is different, and it is not always easy to ascertain, are we in the rails or are we not? Slightly different subject. We were looking for a second brewery uh, in the southeastern United States, and we went to several different communities and talked to people and we you know had our own sort of shiny book of this is who we are and this is what we're talking about doing we ended up in Asheville North Carolina and we did so in part because at every level the city the county and the state Asheville made it clear to us that they were going to sort of clear the way for innovation. They knew we were innovative. They trusted that we wanted to continue to be innovative. And rather than saying, well, we're not sure we're gonna be able to do those, we were talking about bioswales and rain gardens. Um, it's, a, it's a more modern built environment land use planning concept and we have been places where they say, no, 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 sidewalk, curb, and gutter, that's what we have to have. Asheville said, that's really interesting. We think it would be great to do a project with you to try this so we can see, is this part of our land use code going, our development code going forward? That's the kind of thing that businesses want to hear, especially if you're trying to do the new innovative stuff you want to hear that people want to partner with you in that, not at unreasonable levels, but at least starting with yes, rather than absolutely not. And, and when we looked at kind of the, the mean of the different um, city, county, and state governments of all of the places that we looked at, they were the people that really kind of had yes written all over them and, and that's where we ended up and it's been a great partnership. Dr. Hall, you had a question? Um, hi, this is a question for Governor Hinkenlooper. I'm wondering as you prepare to leave office, um, how confident you are that your efforts to make Colorado the most business friendly but the highest ethical sort of, uh, a state with the highest ethical standards sort of continues on. And are there things that you're doing now proactively to ensure that these efforts sort of continue into the future? And that's a great question, a question I think every departing governor, you look over you know, where you've invested your time and how, how secure you feel that those initiatives are going to remain in place or at least have a good chance to get roots. It's, all, it's a little bit like a greenhouse where you're planting bushes or plants or trees uh, and they, they need a certain amount of time to become rooted and institutionalized. So things like the, the Performance Academy. <laughs> Uh, we found ways to fund that for three years going forward, or at least as best we can within the state. The state doesn't really have a, a way of, uh, we're not allowed to spend the next year's budget money, but to really put in place uh, as many of the things we did to find additional funding outside of government. So we had a bunch of uh, efforts or initiatives that were partnerships with various nonprofits or associations, uh, things like the Colorado Technology Association did a couple efforts with them. We would go out of our way to try and find nonprofit sponsors and philanthropists that would fund this stuff for three years going forward. Uh, we also, with the with the High Performance Academy, looked at how do we make sure there's not just the cabinet members, but the the next several layers of managers get as many of them through. Uh, and again, I don't remember, but we're well over what 800 people that have gone through there, a thousand. Yeah, but, but, but a large number of people outside of the people I appoint 
but have gone through and seen the benefits of measuring, of transparency, of having a dashboard that, that shows, hey, this is what we we're gonna do. We haven't gotten it all done, but here's the reasons why, and here's how we're gonna fix it in the next six months or the next 12 months. And I, I guess the, the hope is that, you know, ultimately you're hoping that the public will become so acclimated to this kind of transparency and this kind of accountability, which is really, that, that's one thing the public does care about, uh, that if things begin to change, they'll, they'll notice it and then they'll squawk. Uh, it's also become, when we're talking to the new governors, it's become a little bit of competition, right? So Washington uh, has also invested in, in lean performance reviews. And I know they're either just behind us or just in front of us, it's, but it's, it's a great competition. So the culture within the agencies says, hey, we've got a competition going with, uh, with the state of Washington, and if you disrupt this and take away the funding, uh, we're going to throw a hissy fit. <laughs> People like to win. People like, like to, to win. Like, they like to play the game, right. whatever it is, and they like to win at it. All right, we got one last question here, and then we can wrap up. Um, Governor, I'm curious how often the problem in Colorado has been just kind of a lack of clarity or confusion about what the requirements are from different agencies. I mean, we've seen at Pew around the country that uh, when businesses understand what they're being asked to do, they're more likely to comply, and, and sometimes just education and simplifying the instructions can go a long way. Could you talk about how that's played out here? Sure, and that is a lot of times people just don't know. Uh, or they've misinterpreted. You know, we human beings, and, a, and a, a friend of mine was explaining this to me. Uh, he's a you know a biochemist, but describing how your brain takes things that you read, and it doesn't take the whole sentences. For most people, they just get snippets of the mm. of what you've read, and it stores that. And you will rejumble that stuff sometimes without meaning to. Uh, we had a big effort. Uh, the state of Maine has a, a, a set of laws and regulations that allow property owners who put up a sign, they say, trespass at your own risk. And if you do that, and you let the public hike across, canoe on your lakes, do that, you cannot be held liable if they ha have an accident and get harmed. Even if you left an old coal pit, and, and, you, and there were a bunch of leaves over it, and it's a clear menace and hazard, as long as they're trespassing at their own risk, they have to take that risk. So I thought that was a great idea. Some of our large property owners have private property that insulates some of our most beautiful wilderness areas and places where people would like another access point. A couple of the, the, these landowners said, well, if, uh, if I was held harmless, I might be willing to do this. So we went through this whole process. It turned out we already had the law in place, right? And I think that's, you know, the, it wasn't worded quite perfectly and it wasn't just the way the main law was, but for all intents and purposes it was. And I think language is so malleable. I, had, I played um, wiffle ball when I was a kid. I was fiercely competitive. <coughs> and my best friend was Harry Baird. His little brother was a guy named Douglas Baird. And poor Douglas had to play all the time. He wasn't that crazy about wiffle ball, but we made him play anyway. And we had ground rules, right? The ball gets stuck in the hedge above the height of your head, and it would be a, a, a ground rule triple. Um, on a, with, if the wind was blowing in, it seemed appropriate to me that I would sometimes negotiate, well, on this blowing day, since that ball's up that high, probably should really be a home run. And we'd negotiate the pros and cons of it. Oftentimes these were, just, well, from now on, we'll have this rule, but every day, Douglas Baird would go into his, uh, go at the end of a long day of wiffle ball, and the first thing his mother would say, well, did you learn any new hick and loopholes? <laughs> um, and it is, a, he ended up becoming the dean of the University of Chicago Law School, and would, and would continue to teach contracts. And his first class in contracts, he'd talk about how malleable language is. And people will read the same sets of words and come to two very different interpretations, even with the most well-intentioned, smart people writing the, writing the rules. And I think that's a lot of what, uh, it's not only you know, within regulatory frameworks this happens. This is what the, our, our Court of Appeals and our, our Supreme Court ends up kind of re-litigating or, re, re, or judging what the language really means, and, and then rephrasing it in such a way that you eliminate a bit, uh, you're continuously eliminating doubt and, and uncertainty. Well, Governor, getting to know your successes here in Colorado, uh, 
when you reflect on your wiffle ball career, why am I not surprised to hear you highlight the negotiating role that you played? So <laughs> it's a, uh, really impressive. Um, well, uh, key takeaways, I think, for all of us here uh, in this discussion um, is, uh, number one, this focus on improving um, how states uh, regulate, uh, and it's, that's an economic development strategy. Uh, and the two, how we regulate is taking existing rules and making them better. Uh, these are, are two things that we're looking at really closely uh, at Pew, again, inspired in part by the terrific work that you're doing here in Colorado uh, and eager to do more. So stay tuned for, for us uh, for more on this topic. Uh, please join me in thanking our terrific two panelists for spending so much time with us on this topic. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you to the Pew Trust. We appreciate you actually taking this on and, and putting real resources into getting more people to care about good government. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.